Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name's Phil Gittings, um, and I'll be the moderator today. The focus of the session today is uh, really a commem commemoration of all victims of chemical weapons on the attack of Halabja. This is the focus for today. I'm going to say a little bit shortly about the process of, of how we're going to work today, but my, my job is, is to kind of get out the way to introduce the session. Then we're going to hear from five speakers, experts in the field, who are going to really give a, a broad overview of this topic. And, and I think the speakers have been selected really strategically in the sense that we're going to hear people with real research, um, analysis background, but also lived experiences and also practitioners working in the field. So we have a wonderful kind of mix of speakers. After that, we'll have one minute silence followed by questions and answers. As speakers are presenting, please take the opportunity to write in the chat any questions, any thoughts, et cetera, that you have with regards to uh, the topic being covered. The, the session today is put on thanks to the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association, which is an association of Rotary Peace Fellows around the world. We have about 1,400 in about 115 countries. Uh, we will put in the chat more information about the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association. And the webinar is put on in collaboration with World Beyond War, which is a global grassroots movement to end the institution of war. We have membership in 192 countries. Um, two, I want to do a shout out to two people behind the scenes, uh, particularly Spencer, who's a Rotary Peace Fellow, and Eliha who's also been doing a massive amount of work. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to them. And thank you to our speakers for, for joining us. So hopefully we said a little bit about what the focus of the session will be. Um, and I'm gonna share this slide shortly to give you a sense of who the speakers are. What we're going to do is we're going to do a quick kind of introduction to uh, to the speakers because we really want to hear from the speakers. So what we'll do in the meantime is actually put in the chat a link to their bio so you can find out more about about the speakers. So let me start us off by sharing. The here are the speakers going to today so I think without further ado and we've got an indication of how long they're going to speak for as well as um, the topic that they're, they're going to focus on so to get us started uh, the, the, the topic uh, the history of the use of chemical weapons and we'll have um, Aleha Boyanda to start us off who's a Rotary Peace Fellow and also was is part of um, Tehan Peace Museum. So um, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, the floor is yours, as they say. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Phil, for the kind words. I'm really glad to have this chance to be with you and also to commemorate all the victims of chemical weapons, especially those who I have worked with um, during my time at Tehran Peace Museum. Um, today, I will be talking about the history of the use of chemical weapons. Uh, and by history, we can go back to centuries before today, uh, poisonous arrows, poisonous uh, smokes, but I'm going to cover the modern chemical warfare. So I will be mostly talking about the uh, 20th century today. Um, so I will uh, start with the World War I. Um, for first large scale chemical attack happened on 22nd April 1915. Chlorine gas was used by Germans against uh, French, Canadian and Algerian forces. Uh, and the use of chemical weapons continued during the war by both sides. Uh, later in 1917, uh, mustard gas for the first time was used. So uh, about in, in total during World War I, about 124,000 tons of chemical weapons were used. 90,000 soldiers died in the battlefield and about 1 million work went back home with serious injuries resulted from the use of chemical weapons. Uh, then 
we go to post World War One uh, era. The horrors of World War One and use of chemical weapons led to uh, Geneva Protocol for the prohibition of the use of asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and bacteriological methods of warfare. This uh, international document banned the use of both chemical weapons and biological weapons. And it is important to focus on the word use, uh, use because this document did not prohibit development, production, or stockpiles of such weapons. Also, some countries made reservations uh, in terms of countermeasure, which means if they said if another country is using chemical weapons against them, they will be used, they will be allowed to use chemical weapons. So this was kind of uh, one of the first and earliest uh, documents about chemical weapons, not the first, but one of the first. Uh, then we have uh, the 1920s until 1980 time. Uh, nerve agents were developed during this time. They were never used, although uh, chemical weapons in general were not used uh, during the World War II. Um, there were some other uses or some allegations of the use of chemical weapons during this period of time, but I, uh, due to limitation of the time, I'm not going to talk about them. Before going to the Iran-Iraq war, I just want to mention another important set of regulations, which is international humanitarian law or IHL, uh, which is different from the human rights. IHL is the law of war, which uh, aims to limit the effects of armed conflicts and mostly is rooted in uh, Geneva Conventions 1949 and additional protocols in 1979. Um, there are two important concepts in IHL. Uh, one is IHL tries to protect those who are not participating in conflicts or have ceased participating. So it protects, for example, civilians, journalists, medical staff and hospitals, uh, even soldiers who have been wounded and are, are not finding uh, are not fighting anymore or prisons of wars, uh, prisoners of the wars. Um, also, it restricts the means and methods of warfare. So even if you are fighting, it doesn't mean you can do anything you want. It means you have to discriminate between uh, combatants and civilians. It means that you cannot use weapons or methods that cause unnecessary suffering. You can kill, but you can uh, not make unnecessary suffering. Uh, and you cannot cause long-term damages to the environment. So, uh, environment. And ISL is a part of customer international law, which means that countries uh, who are not member, member states of related uh, regulations are obliged to follow the and, and uh, IHL and uh, 1925 Geneva Protocol, which I uh, mentioned earlier, are really important for uh, uh, our talk about the Iran-Iraq War. So Iran-Iraq War started, uh, started in 1980, lasted for eight years. And from 1983 to 1985, chemical weapons were massively used by Iraq against Iran. Um, Iran and Iraq both, both were signatories of 1925 Geneva Protocols. We had IHL, so the use of chemical weapons was prohibited at the time for both parties. Um, as a result of these massive use, uh, 1,800 tons of mustard gas, uh, about 400, uh, 140 tons of tabun, and 600 tons of sarin were used. Mustard gas is a blistering agent, tabun and sarin are nerve agents, and almost two thirds of uh, this use happened during the last 18 months of the war. So this can be a good question, why the use of chemical weapons uh, escalated during the iran Iraq war as we went forward uh, in time. Um, so as a result, uh, more than 1 million Iranians were exposed, about 5,500 5, were immediately killed, uh, but more than that, today we have more than 65,000 were still suffering from the long-term impacts of uh, the use of chemical weapons. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, um, Iraq used chemical attacks for the first time in history against civilians. So we had at first some villages on, uh, such as Zarde and Dire, and then also we had the chemical attack on Sardash, the first city ever to be bombed by chemical weapons. Homer will talk about that later for us. Uh, we had the chemical attacks on hospitals, uh, chemical weapons should have not been used by some regulations, medical staff and uh, 
wounded people, hospitals should have not been attacked by any means of warfare, but chemical weapons were used against hospitals uh, in two, on two occasions in 1986, uh, Iranian hospitals. Then we have the first battlefield use of nerve agents. So if you remember, nerve agents were developed uh, decades before, but they were never, they had never been used. Uh, as a result, United Nations fact-finding missions, several fact-finding missions, uh, and several UN Secretary General missions were sent to Iran. Um, they prepared the reports and presented them to the uh, UN Security Council, but they were not effective because Security Council did issue some resolutions and some statements, but well, we can say they were either very, uh, very weak or uh, very vague in their language and Maybe this is one of the reasons that as uh, the use of chemical weapons escalated during uh, the Iran Iraq war. Um, so this lack of maybe international reaction led to the continuous use of chemical weapons by Iraq then against its own people. So Iraq started using uh, chemical weapons against its court people, court combatants in 1987 and 1988. And later, um, it continued by using, uh, uh, it was continued by use of chemical weapons during Antwerp operation. Antwerp operation was a massive genocide against Kurds, uh, Kurds in Iraq. About 80,000 Kurds is estimated to have been killed. Um, and chemical weapons were used first to damage the morale of the court fighters and also reduce the support of court people from their fighters. And also because it was a mountain area, very hard to reach for Iraqi soldiers, chemical weapons were used to uh, push people out of their residence in villages or homes, and then they would either be killed or displaced and uh, sent to camps, for example. Uh, Kalab's attack, which happened in, 19, uh, in March 1988, was one of the first attacks um, in, in this period. And we have another guest speaker, which will cover that. Um, Halabs got a lot of attention in the international community, uh, for example, in compare with Sardash or other places. Um, and uh, I think it, it got the attention that the use of chemical weapons requ uh, really required. And at last, um, just very briefly, I will, I'm going to talk about Anscom and Anwik. Uh, follow, following the uh, second goal for uh, Iraq's invasion to Kuwait. Uh, ANSCOM, United Nations uh, Special Commission, we did uh, weapons of mass destruction program of Iraq. Uh, it started enough to work in 1991 and it after uh, there were some allegations of infiltration of CIA, it was it stopped to work in 1999 and it was uh, replaced by ANUWIC, United Nations Monitoring, uh, Verifications, and Inspection Commission. Some of the numbers that I mentioned in my previous slides were, uh, were derived from the ANUWIC reports. Then we have, uh, at the end of the century, Chemical Defense Convention, uh, probably the most successful disarmament treaty, uh, which was signed in 1993 and came into force in 1997. And Paul will definitely talk about that uh, more. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat or um, message me on LinkedIn later or send me an email. I'd be very happy to discuss these issues with you. And thank you to uh, Rotary Peaceful Alumni Association for um, giving me the chance to talk about this topic. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alehe, for that uh, very interesting presentation, giving a, a, a quite broad and then more specific perspective on the history of chemical weapons. Thank you so much. We're going to now move on to our, our next speaker. And as we mentioned, we're going to have uh, different frames in terms of speakers. Now we're going to hear a really kind of um, personal lived experience uh, perspective. Um, Homera will speak next. And she is also a Rotary Peace Fellow, and she's a, a second uh, generation victim of chemical weapons. So, Homera, th thank you so much for being here with us, and uh, please take it away. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Phil. Just let me share my slides. You can see my slides, yeah? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As Phil said, I am Homera, and I am a Rotary Peace Fellow, Class 19, studying MSc Sustainable Development at Bradford University, and also I'm a member of the Organization for Defending Sardash Victims of Chemical Weapons. And today I'm here to talk about Sardash Chemical Attack, and just because I have only five minutes, without any further ado, I'll start my presentation. Um, Sardash is a small city located in the northwest of Iran, very close to the border with Iraq, as you can see from the map. And during the Iran-Iraq war, my homeland was invaded by Iraqi Ba'ath military forces. And on 28 June 1987, um, four chemical bombs were dropped into my city. And unfortunately, in, in the very first hours, 30 persons, mostly children and old people, lost their lives due to severe respiratory problems. Uh, Sadash was the third most populated city in the world after Japan's Hiroshima and Nakazaki uh, to be deliberately targeted with uh, weapons of uh, mass destruction. And also, Sadash is the first city uh, to witness the massacre of uh, unarmed innocent civilians with uh, chemical weapons. But unfortunately, as Eli has said, on that time, the international community didn't condemn this brutal action, which I believe that if people knew about what was happening in Sardash and what are the consequences of using chemical weapons, the massacre and tragedy of Halakta would never happen. Uh, the chemical attack killed over 100 Iranian Kurdish civilians and injured thousands more. Based on unofficial statistics, out of 17,000 of the residents at that time, 8,000 of people uh, of my people were victimized by chemical weapons and they are still suffering from the long, um, uh, long term consequences of this chemical attack. And now I would like to just uh, briefly share uh, our victims' condition and their perspective. Uh, one of our uh, survivors, women survivor, is Faida. Faida at that time had three daughters, but unfortunately she lost one of them. And she said that. The worst thing for me was the lack of support from my own family. They would look at me sometimes as if I were contagious. They didn't want me to come to their parties because the coughing up of fledging disgusted them. I understand it made them feel uncomfortable, but it made life so depressing for me and for my own family. We couldn't go out anywhere. I was always very lonely. We can see that this physical problems that our, uh, our survivors are struggling with, they are suffering from uh, psychological disorders as well, which in some cases are more painful than physical problems. And also, uh, Sadash is a small city and it is a traditional community. And unfortunately, there is a few support exists for our women and cultural expectation made recovery for our women survivors very difficult. And in that case, I am saying that uh, our women survivors are more vulnerable comparing to men survivors. And now I would like to switch on a very important topic, which is uh, about the sanction and how the U.S. sanction uh, can affect our victims. This is the result of the sanction. Um, I said that uh, the Sardash chemical attack happened in 1987, which is like uh, 34 years ago. Uh, during these three decades, our survivors used to use some medicines, which their lives are dependent on that. But after U.S. sanction, this medicine uh, becomes scarce and really uh, hard to find. Therefore, they forced to replace the high quality uh, brand medicine to low quality. And as you can see, this is the result of using low quality brands uh, of medicines. The blister reappear again. And... Uh, not because of Sadash victims, because um, besides Sadash, other cities like Oshnavia, Marijuana, Kermansha uh, were attacked by chemical weapons, and we have uh, victims there. So the prior needs for them is medicine and medical equipment. And also, um, we, we know that any embargo and shortage of medicine have immediate effect on the health of our victims. We strongly condemn any embargo on medical and medicine. 
Uh, thank you everyone for your kind attention. I'm looking forward to take your questions. Uh, if you have any question, you can just email me or take, uh, uh, write it on the chat box and take your uh, questions. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Over to you, Phil. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for another wonderful, and wow, we're covering so much in, in the time, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, you, you covered a lot of ground now. I mean, some of the things to remember is I think you did a great job of touching on the consequences of, of what happened there and how it might have changed the history of what happened next. And another thing I thought was really, really, really important, uh, which we don't do enough of it in the field, is, is really share the real life lived experiences, stories of people in their own words, how they talk for themselves about the devastating effects of chemical weapons. So thank you so, so much for that. With that in mind, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, thank you so much, uh, Zamanko, for, for, for being with us. Uh, Zamanko is, is also um, is, is a chemical weapons survivor part of the International Affairs of Mayors for Peace and the uh, Halabja Secretary. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Alaha, for the uh, very nice uh, introduction, the history of uh, chemical weapon. I, I, and thanks for putting all of this in the sequence, as you say, uh, feel uh, that we start with the history and then Sardash and now we uh, will talk about uh, Halabja, uh, which is the most brutal uh, usage of chemical against civilians. So it is an honor for me as one of the survivors of chemical attack of Halabja to join you at this event and uh, take part in it. I believe most of you by now know how the attack happened uh, in Halabja. Uh, but the missing part that the international community does not know much about it are the long-term consequences of the uh, chemical attack. Uh, so the chemical attack in uh, Halabja happened at the similar time as now. If you visit the street and the market during this time in uh, our area, uh, when only a couple of days are left to celebrate Nowruz, the traditional New Year of Kurdish people, you can easily see the happiness in people's face. You can feel that they are preparing the, themselves for a big event with their new clothes and uh, cleaning their houses. But in March 1988, it was all different. People were staying in their basement in order to just save themselves and their loved ones. Unfortunately, that year, the most brutal usage of history took place in Halabja. 5,000 innocent people died and 10,000 were wounded. Unfortunately, 67% of the casualty were women and children. Today, I decided to emphasize on uh, two cases that are the consequences of the attack. Because of the limitation in time that we have, we cannot uh, cover all the cases and uh, it, it will take hours to go over each cases. So uh, I will do my best to cover as much as I can in the, uh, this amount of time. So the chemical gases uh, affected people's eyes in the temporary and permanent basis. Some lost their eyesight for a couple of months. Some other people uh, got fainted and unconscious after inhaling the gases. And all these made them unable to watch their children, their loved ones. Iran was the only hope for uh, those people at the time of the attack. And the wounded and the survivor were taken to Iran for treatment. Many of those children of those family from Halabja went missing in Iran and some, and some other countries. Some of those children were able to come back to Halabja and found their biological parents. Unfortunately, at the moment there are 142 children that are still missing in Halabja and their family still have the hope to find them after 34 years. I am one of those children who found his biological mother after 22 years through a DNA test. It happened in 2009 and I had a, a great feeling finding my mother after 22 years. 
Unfortunately, after my return, I realized that I have lost my father, four of my brothers, and my sister during the attack. So the second case that I wanted to discuss here is the survivors who are affected by the chemical and they, they were exposed to those uh, chemicals. At the moment, there are 972 people who were affected by the chemical weapon during Saddam Hussein regime. These people do never have the needed care for their specific cases. I do not want to compare the victim, but those victims in Halabja were soft, soft, uh, oppressed and defenseless, comparing to other victims in the world. I will tell you one short story. We have Hushyar and Bakhtiar, two brothers who lost their family members during the attack. They were 11 and 13 years old, just two teenagers at the time. They stayed two days and nights among the dead bodies in Halabja. And they were pretending that they are dead because they were afraid of anyone who is coming to them. After they were found, they were taken to Iran for the basic treatment. Later, when they came back to Iraq, even though they were victims and they were affected by chemical, they had to hide themselves, themselves from the regime. Why? Because the regime uh, was trying to eradicate any evidences uh, on what they have done in Halabja. So Hushyar and Bakhtiar, they were hiding themselves all this time. And you can imagine how, uh, how much uh, suffering they were uh, facing during that time after losing all their family member and after getting exposed to, get, to the gases and all these two, three nights that uh, has impacted them uh, psychologically. And then they came back and they had to hide themselves. Those people with these symptoms were not able to take any support. And after the collapse of the Saddam's regime, the Iraqi government did not even take any responsibility. Uh, and these people are still suffering. They mainly have issues on their lungs and their eyes. There have been a hospital in Halabja for those people, but until now, the government are not able to provide the needed support for those people. Some of them were taken to Iran for treatment in the previous years, but that is not happening anymore as well because of the financial crisis that we are facing in, uh, in this area and also the COVID situation. There are a lot of various aspects of the impact of chemical attack in Halabja, but because of the time limitation, I cannot go through all of those uh, in this session. So what, one good thing about people of Halabja is that they are always hopeful. And if you visit the city today, you will see that there is still life going on. And each of those people in the city have a tragic story of that day but they move on and try to continue their lives. Thanks again for this opportunity. And, uh, and I hope that the a tragic uh, event such as Halabja will never be repeated in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you so much uh, for another wonderful and very personal perspective. Uh, thank you for sharing what you shared. Um, even very more personal with regards to you, you personally, on the one side, a wonderful use of finding your mother after all those years. And thank you for sharing with us. And, and we send our condolences, of course, for what else you shared about losing, you know, people uh, from your family. Um, I think you did a great job of finishing on a wonderful idea of hope. You know, in times where there's devastation around the world, we need people with hope and we also need to work at you know uh, increasing this hope and putting these ideas into action so thank you so thank you so much for sharing that and thank you so much um to all the three speakers so far you're doing a, a great job of keeping on time as well so we're doing a good job thumbs up speakers so let us take a take a step back a moment and think about um where we've come from so far let's just say it like so we started off with a wonderful broad overview of the history and the use of chemical weapons that really sent set a wonderful frame for us uh, for the rest of the discussions after that we heard from Homer who, who spoke um, it gave a specific 
perspective again on a particular case of Sadash. And now we've just heard another particular case of Halabja. So thank you so much for that. Um, for those that have been listening to the speakers, as we mentioned at the beginning, please take the opportunity to write in the chat any questions, thoughts, ideas that you have. We really want to, this to be both informative in terms of sharing information, but also interactive as well. So we're going to have some time for questions and answers after. So without further ado, can we move on to our next speaker now, who's um, Professor Mostasa? Uh, I Jeanette. think we have the clip. You want to skip that? Oh, please, you take it away and tell us which, which clip do you want to show? Um, the, the camera, what is the chemical weapon? Okay, okay, here we go. Okay, thank you for keeping me in check. Okay, so just before we hear from our next speaker, here we go. We're going to watch a short video clip, just bear with me. Okay. Here we go. And please put your thumbs up if you can hear it okay. So, I'm actually in Bolivia. My connection is not always the best. So cross our fingers also. Oh, here we go. Can we hear this okay? What is a chemical weapon? According to the Chemical Weapons Convention, a chemical weapon is any toxic chemical that can cause death or harm to humans or animals through its chemical action on life processes. Any chemical precursor used to produce a toxic chemical. Any munitions or devices designed to inflict harm or cause death through the release of toxic chemicals. This could include mortars, artillery shells, missiles, bombs, mines or spray tanks. Any equipment designed to be used with munitions and devices identified as chemical weapons. There are four types of chemical agents used in chemical weapons, and each one affects the body in a different way. Choking agents mainly inflict injury on the respiratory tract, irritating the nose, throat, and especially the lungs. When inhaled, these agents cause air sacs in the lungs to secrete fluid, essentially drowning those affected. Blister agents are oily substances that act first as an irritant and then as a cell poison on skin and when inhaled. They cause life-threatening blisters affecting the eyes, respiratory tract and skin. Blood agents inhibit the ability of cells to use oxygen, effectively causing the body to suffocate. They generally enter the body through inhalation and are distributed via the blood. Nerve agents affect the peripheral and central nervous system, leading to hyperstimulant glands and other nerves. They are highly toxic with rapid effects and act primarily by absorption through the skin and lungs. The Chemical Weapons Convention bans the development, production, stockpiling, transfer, and use of chemical weapons. It is a total and comprehensive ban against an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. But what about toxic chemicals and precursors that can be used for peaceful purposes, such as in pharmaceuticals or agriculture? The Convention defines toxic or precursor chemicals as chemical weapons depending on their intended purpose. This is called the General Purpose Criterion. The General Purpose Criterion gives member states the right to produce and use chemicals for peaceful purposes. If a toxic chemical or precursor is used for purposes not prohibited by the Convention, in other words, if it is not used to cause death, temporary incapacitation, or permanent harm to humans or animals, then it is not considered a chemical weapon. However, any chemical intended for chemical weapons purposes, regardless of whether it is specifically listed in the Convention or its annexes, including the three schedules of chemicals, is considered a chemical weapon. Learn more at opcw.org. So thank you. Hopefully, I just got the message now. Hopefully you could hear that okay. I know we had lovely visuals. Um, oh, bear, bear with me. 
Hopefully we could hear that okay. Could, could we hear that okay? If not, I will troubleshoot and we could. Okay, <gasps> there we go. There's teamwork. We're all in this together. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just thought about actually looking at that chemical weapons as well and also thinking about the last three speakers that um, it's worth saying, uh, thinking about the contemporary context right now in terms of what's going on in you know Ukraine, that, that chemical weapons is a, is a symptom of a bigger issue, which is the institution of war itself, which makes possible things like chemical weapons. And I think the speakers have done a good job of really highlighting that when we're thinking about chemical weapons, we're not just talking about the chemical weapons and bombs that are dropped in the present here and now. We're talking about the preparation that happens long before this. And we're also talking about our last speakers, in particular, last two spoke about the remnants of chemical weapons after. So with those things in mind, um, we're going to now go deeper into, into the, the, um, the impacts of chemical weapons. And I'm going to share the screen here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mustafa, for being with us. Um, we're going to hear um, a kind of a more expansive um, overview and insight into the, the overall impacts of chemical weapons. and. Um, Mustafa is a physician and researcher in the field of medical treatment of chemical weapons. So thank you so much for being with us and the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Thank you for taking this time to me and uh, let me start with the, uh, just uh, the overview of the uh, Can you see my slide? Not yet, no. If you go down. Okay, to... I shared my screen and. Yes, now we can. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, just, uh, I'm uh, in a 15 minutes. It's time uh, to just uh, say to you about the 20 years experience that gathering in field of the research on chemical victims. And uh, uh, I will, uh, I have to say that this is the old strategy that used chemical weapons against the human and uh, the last and big one would be against Iranian and Iraqi people. It is important in clinical that which uh, item that showed in the field is responsible for the mortality and which of them is responsible for the, the morbidity. When we are talking about the mortality like nerve agents like Mortality is high, but the morbidity is low. But when we are talking about the blistering agent, uh, the morbid mortality is low, but you can see the morbidity is high, about 44.405% uh, uh, the mortality. And uh, it, this is, we are talking just as, uh, about the vesican or blistering agent when we are talking about the long-term effect of the chemical weapons. And uh, about 100,000 of people exposed to, from 1988 to 1980, uh, 1983 to 1988, uh, only about uh, 50,000 are under daily treatment uh, for, for suffering from chemical exposure, especially mustard cough. We didn't see any evidence uh, or any long-term effect, except for the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder and lifestyle and some, uh, some aspect of psychological problem in the nerve agent, just they are suffering from the, that event, but the organ disorder uh, comes from the blistering agent. This blistering agent caused the organ damage from acute to chronic fouls. We didn't find any cure for these patients. 
uh, in acute phase, severe trachobronchitis to uh, hemorrhage to a skin blister, eye injury. And in the late phase, I mean that year, one year later, chronic respiratory disease, a skin pigmentation, conjunctivitis, and recurrent crotitis, and psychological dis disorder and sexual dysfunction are the main problem. And uh, there is a combination of the disease in a person who exposed to mustard gas. These are included the skin problem, pulmonary problem, eye problem, and chronic disease problem, and healthy lifestyle disorder, and a sleep problem. It is important when we gathering all of these uh, organ damage in a person, then the lifestyle will disturb and the post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, anxiety, and several problems occur because of the organ damage. Though so we saw that the, the main item that they are suffering uh, are the respiratory problem. As you see this in, in this uh, uh, picture, this is some dark area and this is some white area here in the high resolution chest CT. The dark area means that the air come to the lung uh, in a check valve vein and uh, the, the lung hyperinflated and uh, the lung uh, don't uh, let to the air go out from the lung. And this is what we found that we termed it bronchiolitis of literon in these cases. And after that, we found that the main item also, the main, also the main item is the respiratory problem, that psychological aspect, social aspect, family aspect, economical aspect, and medical aspect, and uh, international aspect occur following exposure. We uh, found a good strategy to uh, decrease the side effects, not to solve them. Uh, for example, it is important to provide a protocol for lifestyle of this patient. It needs the education of the family. Uh, we need a rehab program for them. Also nutritional rehab, and pharmacological rehab, and also exercise rehab, body rehab, main uh, and mind rehab, and also a treatment protocol. And nowadays, we found that some to the pingulitis of literon with high dose corticosteroid, it is not good. And we withdraw it like for decreasing the inflammation in the short term. And the main item we use is antioxidant, high dose of antioxidant, immunomodulator, and in between the bronchodilator can help us in this regard. We published 200 papers in this regard, and nowadays there is a published book in the United States about the mustard lung that any <laughs> scientist can uh, find it and use it. And uh, we go to the new medical approach. We use the a stem cell uh, therapy for these cases. And we are in the way to find the best approach to cure the uh, problem of this case with new stem cell therapy. And based on this stem cell therapy nowadays in Iran, there is a stem cell transplantation for the eye problem and several injured cases found uh, their uh, vision for this uh, for the second time after blindness with this injury and uh, we are gathering uh, uh, different organs to manage these cases 
we are in the Chemical Injury Research Center for finding the uh, ba for following the basic data, basic research to solve the organ problem, organ impairment. And there is also a foundation of martyrs and veteran affairs to support the psychological problem to lifestyle of these cases. And there is an excellent center for of chemical experience as chemical injury. Nowadays, we transfer all of our experience to other chemical area that can disturb the people. And also we share our experience with the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish uh, physician in Halabche. And we are lucky to visit them each year or each two year in Halabche. And we transfer all of our data to them to uh, have a chance to uh, to treat their patient. And we have started a new systems biological approach that is very new to find a new pharmacological approach for this casing for cure them. Thank you for your attention and I thanks uh, for this time. Just one message is that there is new treatment in the road and in the future we have new treatment and we had a chance to have a, to save our people especially severe injured cases for three decades with different uh, as approach to different uh, organ management and uh, uh, we are happy to save these a nice people beside us, although they are suffering each day from their problems. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Mustafa. Another wonderful presentation, very, very insightful, a broad perspective in terms of the impacts, particularly like um, how you addressed issues from mortality to morbidity, you know, which which gets us to think about that. And also, um, again, the remnants linked to kind of the psychological impacts of, of chemical weapons. Um, I think it was really useful as well in terms of the, uh, addressing the question of, well, what can we do about it? You know, this is the situation how can we address some of these challenges and try and make improvements and you finish there by kind of keeping us thinking what's coming next in terms of to keep making improvements so thank you thank you so much for that uh, without further ado um, we're going to move on to our next speaker um, can, put, put, can you put your, your thumb up if you can see the speaker's slide? Because sometimes my Zoom does funny things. You can. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so let's move on next to um, Dr. Paul Walker, who is the coordinator of the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. And we're going to hear all about that. Um, and, and his talk will focus on uh, ch chemical weapons and also the organization OPCW. So thanks for being with us, Paul. And without further ado, Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's really, I'm really uh, delighted to be here um, with everyone and really also very honored to be able to speak in relation to uh, uh, the memory of victims and the ongoing challenges of victims of chemical warfare. I'm going to try to get my, uh, my slideshow up here. So let's see, I'll share screen. Okay, I'll thanks. Have... While you're doing that, Paul, I don't know, you let us know. Do you want us to show the video first or after you tell us? It, it really is up to you. Why don't, why don't I go first and then we can show the video thereafter. Sure, let's okay. do that. Well, let's see if um, let's see if this will work and then I'll try to maximize it. Is that is that good? Can you see the video? We could we can see this this screen. We can see the PowerPoint, but it's not maximized like it was before. No. Um, all right, let me go back and um, see if I can find it here. Let's see. How about there? We're not seeing Still anything not as yet. Still not where well, we're not seeing anything as yet. Um, if let me know. I mean, I'm happy to share it my side, but I think it's better if you can because you can flick through and yeah. take, you know. It's you still don't see it large form. 
we don't see it at all currently. Well, I don't. I don't know if others. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, let me uh, go back here. And I will open. And uh, I'm still looking for it. Okay. Sorry, this is taking so long, but we'll see if we can get it there. No worries, and uh, yeah, thanks. While you're doing that, ev everyone, thank you for your for, for listening. I know there's there's a couple of questions coming in already into the chat, and uh, you know, leave it to the speakers to answer some of those questions. And please take the opportunity to write any other questions or thoughts that that you have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you from you, you know, who are here with us today about any thoughts, questions, comments, etc. You have about what you've heard. We're going to have some time for questions and answers later, but um, let's take the opportunity while we're waiting for Paul to open up the PowerPoint. Now, how about there? Does that look okay? No, you're not share. You're not sharing the screen as yet. So go to um, share screen, the green one at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. And then it should. Let's all cross our fingers. Uh, Oh, someone's being very technical here, Warren. Uh, that says press press function and F five. That's even more complicated for me. I think I don't know about for you, Paul, but but um, yeah. So if we could if you could find the share, here we go. Share screen. There we go. I think we're we're getting there. And let's see. It's not full size here. It's not full size, but we we can see. It. Here we go. It's getting better. There we go. So I think. We can see that. Can we? Can we see? Can we see that? Paul, Paul, just press on the uh, large screen at the bottom there. You are near it, where it's got eighty-four percent. Press on the large screen. Okay, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. Still not maximizing. So I try the function F five. F five. It's function F five. Okay. I think yeah. If we if we're not getting, I think we can see we can see it, can't can't we? We can see it, everyone. So if 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 can we make a well, suggestion? Yeah, go for it, Paul. I would say yeah, I would say I'll go for it, and hopefully there won't be. There's a couple of slides maybe you won't be able to quite discern, but I've tried to use large print. So uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chemical Weapons Convention. I know uh, prior speakers already did that, but let me um, let me just say it is uh, it is probably the most successful multilateral arms control treaty we've had to date. Uh, as the bullets you'll see here was open for signature in January 1993. We had about 120 countries actually sign on board immediately. All, most of all the major powers, uh, all the major countries joined. Uh, it took 12 years or more, depending on when you start counting in negotiation. <clears throat> uh, both the Soviets and the Americans had agreed several years earlier four or five years earlier in the late 1980s to in fact uh, destroy their chemical weapon stockpiles unilaterally and reciprocally. Uh, so the convention was really the sort of icing on the cake uh, in agreements already made between the two um, largest chemical weapon stockpile holders. Uh, and the United States, uh, as some of you probably know, actually began destroying their stockpile unilaterally in 1990, three years before the treaty was even open for signature. Uh, it ended into force uh, April 29th, 1997. Um, the United States barely ratified, I think it ratified three days before then, uh, to get in under the wire as an initial uh, state party. Uh, the Russians took a longer period of time. The Russians actually ratified in December of 1997. But it was good they both got on board. And today we have 193 states parties, uh, which is the largest number for any treaty except the United Nations itself. Um, four countries are still outside of the CWC, and I'll mention those later. And eight countries declared actual chemical weapon stockpiles that need to be destroyed under the treaty. Um, and uh, many more countries had tested and developed stockpiled chemical weapons. There were probably three dozen countries at least. But all of those countries um, rid themselves of their chemical weapon stockpiles sometime before the treaty ended in a force. Um, 
the OPCW is the organization that was set up. It was supposed to be at first in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Dutch uh, outbid the Swiss, I guess. As you know, there's always competition between the Austrians, the Swiss, and the Dutch for multilateral organizations in general. Uh, and this building was built uh, new, uh, opened in 1997. Has about, uh, all of you know this, I know, because many of you are members of the CWC coalition and join us there uh, many years. Uh, it has about 475 employees, depending on, depending on maybe give or take 50, depending on which year you look at it. It's got about an $80 million, year, a million euro budget. And that's been stagnant for about 10 years or more. The effort by the state's body to sort of flatline the budget has been very difficult in a variety of ways. And I can talk about the budget more if you like, but it's about 80, 80 million euros a year. Paul, Paul yeah. just, a, just a quick one. It seems as though that the slides are not changing for us. They're not. So, so no. no. Um, yeah, so. Maybe, I mean, do you want to go uh, try and try to show the slides yourself? Yeah, OK, here we go. Why don't okay. we do that? And I'll take mine down here. Okay. Um, I'll say stop share. And maybe you can share them and see if they go better for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah I was yeah. already into the third, third or fourth slide. So. Okay. So, okay. No worries. Sorry about that. Here we go. Um, let me just find it. It's never easy with uh, zooming in PowerPoint. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just bear with me. Just finding the actual, I've got all the presentations here, just finding the right one. I, think my, I have it ready, Phil, if you want. Do you, to. please, could you, yeah. yeah, could you manage that? Thank you. I bet LA does much better than I did. You just have to back up a little bit, LA. That's where I was. That was the slide I was on. Can everyone see those? Yeah. Oh, good. So, um, in general, I want to say that the, the budget of the OPSW has uh, flatlined basically over the last decade. And it's been a lot of concern over uh, lack of funding, lack of annual increases, uh, just based on inflation uh, and the like. And I think to some extent, this was just, this uh, sort of negative trend was just broken this past year. Um, and basically the OPSW set it to, first of all, verify uh, safe and secure destruction of all chemical weapon stockpiles. And it also ongo uh, is, is ongoing inspections of both military and commercial chemical facilities. I think many people um, are unaware of that, that in fact, they don't just inspect military stockpiles. So the stockpiles are going to be gone in another couple of years. So um, they also do 240 odd uh, commercial inspections every year of Commercial chemical facilities is about 6,000 in the world. Uh, so it's still gonna take a few more years to catch up with every facility, but that's to make sure that chemicals are not diverted to you know, illegal purposes. Uh, next slide. At entry into force uh, of, the, of the convention, about 72,500 metric tons. That number has varied a little bit over time, but it's in that range. It depends on when you start counting, of course, for the United States, because the U.S. had destroyed uh, 1,500 metric tons even before the treaty entered into force. But Russia had the biggest stockpile, 40,000 metric tons. Uh, the United States, the second, uh, 28,600. Uh, in the U.S., we talk about 31,500 U.S. tons. India, about 1,000. Uh, that's an estimate because India refuses publicly to give any numbers on its stockpile or any information on it actually. South Korea, about 600, but that's an estimate because South Korea also refuses even its name to be used uh, in diplomatic circles uh, that it ever was a possessor state. Uh, Libya, 26 metric tons. Albania, 16 metric tons. Uh, Iraq, uh, we don't know because it was remnants of the uh, UNSCOM and UNMOVIC operations in Iraq, and these were all buried in uh, sealed bunkers in Iraq. Um, and Syria, 1,308 uh, metric tons. I put estimated there because we thought Syria had uh, you know, given up all of its stockpile, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. But in fact, uh, they've continued to use chemical weapons. Uh, next slide. 
this was the U.S. stockpile sites. I, I don't, I'm not going to go through this quickly. I just want to say we had nine uh, top secret stockpile sites in eight states and on Johnson Atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, about 800 miles west of where I am right now in, in Hawaii. And I put two of the names of these in uh, red. You'll see one is called Bluegrass Army Depot, uh, one of the stockpile sites on the right. And the one on the left is Pueblo Chemical chemical depot, Pueblo, Colorado, down in southeast uh, Pueblo, uh, southeast Colorado. And those are the two stockpiles we're still working on. The, that still is being very, very carefully uh, destroyed with a lot of environmental and public health controls. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Russian map, uh, that, that uh, lettering is probably too small for you to read, but the Russian stockpile, as I say, was very large. I've been to every one of these stockpile sites uh, in the 90s and the 2000s uh, when we were trying trying to uh, help Russia in destroying, choosing its uh, technology and building the structures and uh, destroying, safely destroying the stockpiles. The one point I would make out is the, uh, the most, uh, the site on the far right, the eastern site, is a place called Shucha. And that's the stockpile I first went to in 1994 uh, when I uh, helped to organize the first on-site inspection, American on-site inspection of a Russian chemical weapon stockpile. And um, that was uh, destroyed a few years ago. And Russia has since uh, been able to actually uh, really destroy all of its stockpile, at least in first stage, uh, with a lot of help from the West, uh, from the United States, from Germany in particular with Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, France, other countries uh, has really been able to destroy its stockpile and finished in, in first stage though. We can talk about that more if you'd like. Uh, they finished in 2017. Uh, next slide. And this is the uh, pictures of the Shuchi stockpile, the one I just mentioned, which was the easternmost, the only one east of the Ural mountain range. It's really out, um, oh, two hour drive from the nearest large city, I'd say, really in the steppes of Siberia, um, above ground, uh, old decrepit metal warehouses with rows and rows sort of wine racks of uh, artillery shells that look like this. Uh, and next slide. And then they had uh, uh, scud and frog, you know, short and medium range missile warheads that look like the photo on the left. And, I took these photos uh, in 2002 when we broke uh, ground actually for the first, uh, the first uh, demilitarization facility, destruction facility, which was 20 miles from the stockpile. And <clears throat> one of our concerns over there was there was very little security on all the Russian stockpiles. So we, we worked to get security on uh, this stockpile site in Shucha and a, a sister site more or less in um, in the Udmurt Republic, a place called Kiesner, uh, which had the small shells. You see five different calibers of, of rocket and artillery shells here. Uh, and at this site, there were 5,400 tons of nerve agent uh, in about 10 million um, weapons at that point. Uh, next slide. And so today, the United States, you know, was the first to start with the chemical stockpile uh, destruction. Uh, to date, we've, after 32 years, uh, we've destroyed about 98% of the stockpile. We have seven stockpiles which are closed, are being torn down, cleaned up, demil totally demilitarized. Not necessary under the Chemical Weapons Convention, but really a good step forward. And the United States, for its own destruction program, has spent about $40 billion to date. I mean, an enormous amount. It's one of the largest uh, military programs in the history of the Department of Defense. Um, and we have now 18 months to go. Uh, officially, we're supposed to finish by September 2023, which was the final agreed deadline uh, under the Chemical Weapons Convention. And that's a picture, actually, of one of the incinerator sites. Um, that site actually is in Umatilla, Oregon. That's now gone. It finished a number of years ago and has now disappeared totally. Uh, next slide. And then in Russia, I would just say that the Russians really didn't begin until 2002. Um, you know, they began, in essence, 12 years after the United States began. Uh, they had 
in the 1990s, they had no idea of their inventory, even they had no idea of their uh, technologies that would be um, uh, the best and most safe. So the West under the cooperative threat reduction and eventually under the global partnership came in and, and uh, spent, I think, two or $3 billion uh, helping Russia to um, build these facilities. The Germans in particular built a number of the facilities themselves um, for the, for the uh, Russians. And that got the Russians going. And they eventually wound up uh, destroying all the stockpiles, as I mentioned, by 2017. So it took 15 years. So their, their actually throughput of destruction was actually much faster than uh, the Americans. And that was partly because the Russian weapons were much more simple. Uh, they had no explosives inside. They had no detonator caps and things of that nature. And so they were much safer and much easier and much simpler to destroy. And I think they had, they had uh, to some extent, fewer environmental and public health and, and public demands in general on the destruction program. Uh, next slide. And I just mentioned these briefly uh, so we know where they were. Albania, 16 metric tons, that's a whole long story. That's the picture of, of the part of the Albanian stockpile, which the Albanians, when they first joined the treaty, um, stated that they had no chemical weapons. And then a few years later, they came back and said, whoops, we think we found a building, you know, in the mountains outside of Tirana that looked like they may be chemical agents. And sure enough, these were, these were tanks with the mustard agent inside, all mustard agent, which is pretty easy to neutralize with uh, hot water. And uh, they all had Chinese markings on them. So they were, they obviously came from China at some point in the previous uh, Albanian administration. South Korea had a fairly complicated stockpile, uh, quite modern, 600 metric tons, quite a bit. Uh, and that was destroyed by 2008. And we don't know anything publicly on where they were, how they were destroyed. But I would assume, uh, given that they looked very much like the newest American stockpile, uh, that in fact they were probably burned in uh, incinerated in in South Korea. India, a thousand metric tons, once again destroyed by 2009. We know that in documents from the OPSW, uh, but we don't know much more about where they were, how they were destroyed. Um, but I would assume those were burned as well in India. Libya, of course, was complicated, destroyed in 2014 and 2017, about 26 metric tons. Iraq entombed all their remnants of their old Saddam Hussein chemical weapons program finished in 2018. Um, and they joined the treaty late, as you probably know, they joined, I think in 2000, was it nine? And, uh, and then Syria, which is a complicated you know, story. And I could talk a couple hours just on the Syrian process, but I won't. But uh, we finally got uh, all the chemical weapons declared by Syria out and uh, moved onto a ship called the Cape Ray, neutralized on the ship. Uh, and there was a few tons destroyed actually in 2015. Next slide. I'd, I'd mentioned too under the OPSW, there's an annual recognition of victims as a monument at the OPSW you see here in front of you. This picture was taken a few years ago. And in fact, some of you may actually be in this picture. Um, uh, the annual day of remembrance, 30 November, which is right at the beginning of the annual conference of states parties. There's also, there was also a major centennial commemoration of the victims and the use of chemical weapons uh, in Ypres, Belgium uh, in 2015, which was the 100th anniversary when they were first used in 1915 by the Germans. And then there's also a trust fund for chemical weapon victims, which has been set up in the last uh, six or eight years, I think, at the OPSW. Uh, next slide. And I just mentioned we have the other issue. Once we destroy the declared stockpiles, uh, which hopefully you know will finish in the United States in 2023, uh, and the pro and the program is going very well. I'd be happy to talk more about that if you'd like at Pueblo and Bluegrass. Uh, but we have buried chemical weapons all over the world, at least around the northern hemisphere. Uh, all the warring nations of the last century in World War One, World War Two, you know. To a large extent, when they get rid of their stockpiles, they either buried them, and this is a picture from downtown Washington, D.C., where we've been working on finding old World War I buried chemicals from the uh, National Chemical Weapons Laboratory of World War I uh, in Northwest Washington. Uh, to next slide. 
all nations have dumped chemical weapons at sea as well. And <clears throat> I know people hate to talk about this because there's, there's probably 500,000 tons or more dumped in every ocean of the world except Antarctica. But eventually we're, go we're going to have to face this and figure out ways of uh, researching what the impact is on the environment and on public health, particularly in the, in the food chain and uh, move on and clean up the seas as best we can. Uh, next slide. I'll just have a few conclusions and I'll, I'll be finished. Uh, number one, I'd say chemical weapons are no longer viable military weapons and have become taboo, morally reprehensible and a dangerous burden. Two, all possessor states must complete safe elimination of their stockpiles in the near term. And the US still has approximately 713 US tons at Pueblo and Bluegrass. Three, all non-member states must join the Chemical Weapons Convention. We have four countries, Egypt, Israel, North Korea, and South Sudan, who still have not joined the convention. Israel has signed, but not ratified. We know North Korea has a large stockpile, probably 5,000 metric tons. And there are suspicions always around Egypt and Israel having stockpiles, um, particularly Egypt that used some chemical warfare materials years ago. Um, but there's no proof of that. And South Sudan, we know, do not have chemical weapons. Uh, and it's such a new state and in such disarray. They're still trying, I know, to join, but they haven't yet. I'd also mention in that regard, uh, Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, although it doesn't have chemical weapons, to the best of my knowledge, and never has, um, it has an enormous uh, global chemical industry. And at some point, it has to be uh, allowed to join the treaty or at least allowed to have uh, OPSW inspection so we can inspect their chemical industry. Uh, next slide. Protection of the environment, public health, worker safety and weapons demilitarization processes is an absolute necessity, trumping deadlines and budget limits. There's been this push to meet um, somewhat arbitrary deadlines under the Chemical Weapons Convention Treaty. I can talk about the there were four major deadlines. I can talk about those more if you'd like. Uh, nobody met those deadlines actually. And I think the diplomats, when they wrote the treaty, somehow figured that people could eliminate their stockpiles in 15 years or less. And that's just not the case if you want to protect the environment. Um, transparency, stakeholder, stakeholder involvement, public dialogue, and consensus building are essential to program success. And <clears throat> I emphasize this because my experience with the programs in demilitarizing stockpiles over the last 25 years is that the, the first reaction of, of militaries, defense departments uh, in the program is to be secretive, not involve the public, not be terribly worried about environmental concerns uh, and uh, just uh, shake their head and roll their eyes when you talk about open dialogue and consensus building. So that has really, all these things have been emphasized in the United States. We, we tried to emphasize these in Russia quite a bit once we uh, convinced the Russians to move forward and in villages there complained. Uh, but programs like uh, South Korean program and the Indian program, uh, to my knowledge, had absolutely no public information and dialogue around them at all. Uh, and then I would say abolition of a whole class of weapons of mass destruction is really an historic achievement. Uh, next slide. And my last, this is my, really my last slide, threats of, but threats of accidental state and terrorist use remain requiring uh, emergency preparedness, response mechanisms, and first responder training. And I think the examples that we've had by the continued use of chemical weapons in the Syrian war, uh, the assassination of Kim Jong-nam in Kuala Lumpur airport a few years ago in Malaysia by the North Koreans, uh, the attempted assassination of Sergei Skripal in, in Britain in 2018 with, with a Novichok militarized nerve agent uh, by Russian agents, and then the attempted assassination of uh, Navalny in uh, Russia in 2020 uh, by Russian agents again with Novichok are really examples that we have to be able to deal and allow countries to be fully prepared uh, when, when and if and when chemical weapons are used. Next to the last point, non-lethal industrial chemicals, for example, chlorine, also pose serious risks and can still be lethal, shown in Syria and Iraq today, uh, with the use by Syria of chemical barrel bombs and even by ISIS terrorist forces 
uh, in uh, Syria and Iraq uh, with mustard agent weapons. And then a chemical weapons free world will still not be void, devoid therefore of dangerous chemicals. Uh, and next slide, hello. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. I think I went over maybe a couple minutes too long, but hopefully that's okay. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. Again, wow. So many things covered in, in your presentation. Um, thank you for giving an overview of, again, some of the impacts um, of chemical weapons and speaking specifically about the, the work of the organization prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, one of the things I like that you touched on within your presentation in particular is you touched on the human, economic and environmental costs of chemical weapons. And uh, it's, it's really powerful and needed to have personal perspectives that we heard from other speakers. And it's also really needed and necessary and powerful to, to hear the data, to, to, to get the numbers. And I thought you did a great job of talking about the numbers in terms of stockpiles, in terms of how much is being spent, etc. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to everybody for listening. We've heard what five wonderful speakers. What we want to do now before closing is two things. One, um, a one minute silence, and we're gonna look at that in a moment. Um, and then also some time for question and answers. And I'll say a little bit more when we get to that part. But thank you, everybody, for writing in the chat. We've got some great questions so far um, uh, with regards to from, from Margaret, from Flavia, from Soros, et cetera. So one suggestion after we do the one minute silence is if if people want to um, actually speak their questions, you know, and so you can put your hand up and we can look around or you can use the reaction and put your hands up and then perhaps we can call on you to ask your question. And when you're asking your question, um, state who you want to target your question at, please. Thank you so much. So before we get to that, let's do the one minute silence. And um, Alehe, are you okay to, um, to do the one minute silence, please? Uh, sure. So we heard today that there are victims of chemical weapons all, uh, all around the world, thousands of them uh, living today, thousands have already passed away. Some are still uh, dying as a result. I have lost uh, one friend this year myself at Tehran Peace Museum. So I think it's a good time to just uh, pay our tributes and kind of commit ourselves to do whatever we can to have a world free of mass destructions and specific chemical weapons. So I'm going to mute myself and put the timer in one minute. And I think it's a good time to reflect on, on what we also have learned today. And remember that uh, there are victims of chemical weapons living today and some have passed away already. Thank you all uh, for dedicating this time to, to the victims and survivors of chemical weapons. And Phil, we are ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for doing that one minute silence. So, so, so really over to you with regards to questions. So please feel free to put your hand up. And um, okay, we've got, a, we've got Matthew. Uh, Matthew, please, please go ahead. And before Matthew goes ahead, we've... Uh, in advance spoke to the speakers and we want to be respectful of your time. So on the clock, we've got about eight minutes left, but speakers have been very kind and said that they can stay on a little bit longer if there's more questions and if we want to continue. So Matthew, please go ahead. I don't know if you could put your video on so we can see you as well, but it's up to you. But we firstly love to hear from you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for calling on me. I'm uh, doing this chat from New Zealand right now. Um, it's really uh, lovely to hear this conversation. Um, I, I'll try to make it fast since we don't have much time, but my question uh, echoes uh, two or three of the people that have commented in the chat. 
and that's that um, uh, there was, uh, Mr. Walker uh, talked extensively about the destruction of the Russian chemical weapons stockpiles, yet um, even as recently as this week, uh, there's been a discussion that Russia might use chemical weapons in Ukraine. And of course, even in his own presentation, he talked about chemical weapons being used against Mr. Um, um, uh, various um, Russian politicians uh, who crossed Vladimir Putin. Um, so I guess uh, there's a huge worry around how do we know that Russia has actually eliminated their stockpile? And um, uh, to what degree is there a fear that they could use those weapons in Ukraine. And that seems to have summarized both my questions and the questions in the chat. So thank you very much for your time. And that's just to all people, not just Mr. Walker. Um, I'm happy to take that. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I was just on uh, BBC radio earlier uh, today talking about this as well. And I'll try to make it brief given the time frame. Um, on Syria, Syria declared 1,308 uh, metric tons. We've, we've verified, inspected, verified, destroyed all those chemicals. They were, as you know, uniquely uh, destroyed outside of Syria, which is really against the treaty. But in fact, given the civil war, it was, it was pretty impossible and certainly very dangerous to even attempt to try to destroy the chemicals with a lot of private contractors and other people. And the OPSW inspectors who went in to verify the movement and the transport and finally the end destruction of all these uh, for the first time had to wear bulletproof vests and 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 drive in armored cars you know after over over 30 years or not quite over 20 years of inspection operations by then uh, now we know given that chemical weapons have been used um, likely hundreds of times in Syria uh, since their before and since their chemical weapons stockpile was destroyed, uh, their declared stockpile. And we know that they probably didn't declare all their agents and precursor chemicals and or they probably imported pre precursor chemicals as well. And have also used an, a non-declarable chemical, namely chlorine in chlorine barrel bombs. So there's loads of issues around this at the OPSW. Uh, all the rights and privileges of Syria have now been suspended at the OPSW means they can no longer vote. They can't vote in plenary. They can't be a member of the executive council. Uh, they can't have employees at the OPSW, things of that nature. Um, so we know Syria is, is basically violating the convention and cheating. And uh, there'll be ongoing discussions about this in future months and, and years. Uh, with Russia, Russia, I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced Russia destroyed all of its chemicals at the uh, seven very large chemical weapon stockpile sites they had. That was all inspected. You know, the OPSW inspectors inspect these programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, so uh, we know all of that was destroyed. Um, on the other hand, we know they've used uh, small amounts of militarized chemical agent, namely Novichok, which is a type of nerve agent. Um, uh, they've used that at least twice in assassination attempts and potentially more. Now, these have been small amounts, you know, laboratory size, you know, they disguise them in perfume bottles actually when they traveled with them to Britain. Um, and even a small amount, say a quarter of a liter or something could potentially kill if it's sprayed and, and uh, spread in the right way could kill hundreds, maybe thousands of people. So um, we know the Russians have also violated the treaty. I always talk about the V word violation. Nobody wants to use that word, but in fact, they violated the treaty as well. And there's loads of ongoing discussion about this uh, at the OPSW. In fact, this week, uh, half of the executive council, over 20 countries uh, left the executive council meeting as the Russian ambassador began to speak in protest. Uh, do we, do we, what's the whole story about, you know, using potential chemical weapons in uh, Ukraine? Uh, this is another long story. I'd simply say, I don't think the Russians have any major uh, weaponized chemical weapons at all, but they could go the route of Syria and use chlorine, like a chlorine barrel bomb, or they could use a small amount like Novichok again, and maybe kill a few Ukrainian soldiers or a few scientists somewhere and allege that the Ukrainians did. 
And the Ukrainians have no chemical weapons. They've never had chemical weapons. They have no chemical facilities uh, to produce this stuff that, um, you know, could be weaponized. So, you know, I think it's, it's a real threat. I think that Russia could do a false flag event potentially and try to escalate the warfare uh, in Ukraine a bit. I hope they don't do this because this would ratchet up the whole crisis as it stands today. Uh, but given that they've been in full support of what Syria has done over the last eight years, uh, along with a few other countries, by the way, that I won't mention right now, um, you know, they, um, they really could do something like this. But I don't think you'll see a major chemical warfare attack in Ukraine at all, unless they attack chemical industry facilities. And Ukraine has an enormous chemical industry, a lot of it with toxic chemicals like most other major countries. Uh, and if they were to attack an industry, which is my biggest worry, then we could see uh, downwind enormous casualties like we saw in Bhopal in India in, you know, 1984, when about 10,000 people were killed downwind of a, of a chemical industry accident. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Matthew. Hopefully that addressed your question. And, and any of the other speakers, please feel free to add to what Paul has shared. Uh, meanwhile, if, if people want to add, and, and meanwhile, also, if, if, um, if there's any more questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, Ella, hey, yeah, please go ahead. And then we will go after to Ayushi. Yes, and then I'm Margaret. actually going to address Flavia's question in uh, the chat box, if that's okay. And the question in um, summary is about Chemical Defense Convention and its regulation to support the victims, uh, especially the stigma. So in general, uh, Chemical Defense Convention doesn't have any regulations about uh, victims. Even the word victims, has not been really mentioned in, in the convention. And this is probably one of the uh, weakest points of, of chemical defense convention. In 2011, Conference of States Parties uh, decided to establish international support network of victims of chemical weapons. Um, and, uh, and, and during like uh, for that also the trust fund to support of the victims, which Paul mentioned. But um, the trust fund is completely uh, dependent on voluntary contributions of the state's parties. And there are a lot of political aspects on that on what to do with this money, um, which victims, which type of activities can be covered with these activities. So far, um, one medical guide of uh, treating the victims have been public, has been published. The second one is, I think, undergoing, Professor uh, Ghani is actually the chief editor of, of that one. Um, there are also, there have been some push, I guess, by the coalition, um, some uh, victims, uh, NGOs have been able to attend the Conference of States parties and raise their, their concerns. Uh, there is uh, outreach uh, in, in, in uh, organization for prohibition of chemical weapons. Some, depending on who is member, can try and their needs and their stigma. But generally, as a general rule, uh, Chemical Defense Convention does not address the issue of victims as a policy. And it's really dependent on, on what is going on at the moment of the time, or how much money is available in the trust fund. So this is a sad, really, a really sad point of, uh, that I think it's good to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Elahe, and thank you, Flavia, for the, the great question. So we'll move on to um, Ayushi. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question, and then after we'll go to Margaret after. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I actually don't have a question, but I just wanted to um, thank you for organizing this uh, webinar and for all the speakers to actually present their insightful views. So uh, Tony Robinson over here and I, we, I just wanted to introduce our organization. We are part of the Middle East Treaty Organization. Uh, we are basically campaigning for the creation of a WMD-free zone in the Middle East. And we have various uh, different um, project streams. And one of the recent, most recent project streams that we have introduced is the humanitarian initiative, which will cater to uh, primarily the victims of the WMD usage in the region. 
so uh, pertaining to the the you know the issue and the topic of this webinar i wanted to introduce uh, our um, initiative and um, and also wanted to extend any uh, sort of invitation for a future collaboration and with all the speakers over here and um, uh, especially the uh, the anniversary of the halabja uh, chemical attack that is coming over here we uh, would uh, also like to um, you know organize interviews or um, any um, um, uh, uh, any sort of uh, you know collaboration from the uh, the speakers and from the rotary foundation as well so yes we just uh, uh, tony has uh, given the website uh, in the chat box and it would be great for us if you could just uh, you know see the website and see what our agenda is and um yes so thank you very much thank you so much thank you yes and uh, thank you tony for putting the information um so we we've put the details with regards to the rotary peace fellowship alumni association so please reach out to us um and, and would love to hear from you in addition i'll put the the world beyond war we've um we won the 2021 us peace prize uh will be on war for our work in um advocating against the institution of war and the uh creative peace education approaches so please reach out I, I wear both hats i'm a peace fellow but i'm also the education director for world beyond war so please feel free to reach out to either the rotary peace fellowship alumni association world beyond war the speakers here etc speakers if you if you feel comfortable please write your email uh, um your linkedin etc um, and let's hope that our time together kind of leads to more time together in the future. So yes, all about collaboration. So can we go to Margaret now, please? Yes, just quickly, I'm interested to know what the impact of chemical weapons use has been on unborn children at the time of the attack. Have you seen an increase, for example, in birth defects? I, who, who are you um, focusing that question on? Uh, anybody in particular? Our, speak, our speakers, either from uh, Iran or Iraq. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Phil, I can take that. So thank you so much for your question, Margaret. Uh, actually, in Halabja, and I think I saw Homera also mentioning the same in Sardesh, uh, that we are facing such a problem in the, in the next generation, but uh, there is no scientific proof for that. So I can say like uh, what we can notice in Iraq, that is the number of uh, cancer reported in Halabja is uh, more than anywhere else. Uh, but actually there is no scientific proof for the uh, impact of the chemical on the next uh, generation. Anyone else want to add to that of our speakers? Just as I mentioned before, if, uh, in the case of Sardash, we are witnessing some disorder, genetic disorders from the next generation. But uh, there are some articles about that. But uh, as I said before, it's not scientifically 100% proven that there is like a connection between that. And if I may add, this lack of knowledge is actually an important point. Um, there has not been enough chemical weapons, uh, long-term impacts and how they affect. And this is going, maybe we can relate it to the previous question and how the issue of victims of chemical weapons has generally been like a lot of more research required to really find cures. We don't have cure for, for example, mosquito gas how to find the correlations, associations, and causations of chemical weapons. And this is a good point. This is a kind of good indication of how we are lacking enough research and, and to support our victims. Thank you. Yeah, great ad there. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Um, any other questions? Put, put your hands up. Or, or if not, I know, um, Swartz, are you there? Um, I know you are, and asked a few questions in the chat. I don't know if you, um, another Rotary Peace Fellow, I don't know if you want to um, Take yourself off mute and ask one of your questions that you raised. If not, I can write it in the chat and one of the speakers can take it up. How, so, how safe is M. Tong? Who wants to take that question in the chat? I'm happy to, <clears throat> I'm happy to take that. Um, Iraq, <clears throat> this is around Iraq and Iraq um, had chemical weapons. We all heard about 
what Saddam Hussein did in Halabja and in the Iran Iraq, Iraq War in the 1980s. Um, after Saddam was pushed out of Kuwait in 19, what was it, 1991? Um, and uh, the United Nations inspector groups went in and collected all the, the weapons, the agents, the, the laboratory materials, precursor chemicals, all of it. They basically entombed it in um, uh, two big, I can just describe it as sort of uh, big concrete bunkers, above ground bunkers, or even concrete pyramid type warehouses. And they sealed up the warehouses then. In the, in the 2003 war, as I understand it, uh, the Americans and the Brits uh, bombed those areas. And at least one of those um, entombment um, concrete warehouses with old Iraqi chemicals was hit by a laser guided bomb that didn't explode, it landed right in the middle of the, of the roof, in the middle of the warehouse. And so Iraq, when it joined the convention, finally in 2009, I think it was, um, uh, was very anxious to you know, follow up in their obligations and to get rid of these chemicals. But the, the studies they were on, <clears throat> they went in and they sort of tested, I think the wide variety of chemicals in these bunkers. Um, it, it really looked like a very dangerous, very expensive operation. Not only would you have to remove the unexploded American bomb that was 500 pound bomb, at least in, in the middle of it, one of them, but you'd have to deal with all sorts of sort of spilled chemicals and the like. So it was finally agreed, and this was quite a contentious discussion at the OPCW, that in fact, the Iraqis could entomb, basically fill the bunkers as best they could with concrete, poured concrete in, sealed the whole bunkers up and just left them there. So in, in my regard, the chemicals are not really destroyed. And under the convention, you have to destroy all your chemicals, it has to be irreversibly destroyed and done safely with protection of public health and the environment. This was not done. Uh, so the Iraqis, you know, to their maybe discredit, have pushed the, you know, pushed the ball down the, kicked the ball down the road a little bit. And at some point, some Iraqi government will have to, you know, engage and begin to carefully. Uh, destroy and remediate uh, these two bunkers, but they're they're not you know a, an issue of security now. Be extremely difficult and dangerous to break into these bunkers in any way. So, in some way, you know they've been done away with. But in fact, at some point, it'll have to be further processed down the road. Thank you, Paul. And I know that uh, LA has got, got a hand up and we'll, we'll come to, to you in a moment if, if, that's, if that's okay. But I think in terms of respecting people's time, we'll probably wrap things up, but we, we want to leave the last words to LA. But let me just take a, take a step back and say a massive thank you to you all for being here. A massive thank you to the, the Rotary Peace Fellow um, Alumni Association. Please follow us in collaboration with um, world beyond war if we think about uh, what's been covered today we've covered a whole kind of array of things related broadly to chemical weapons and disarmament um ella hey give a, a really wonderful kind of setting the scene in terms of the historical context of chemical weapons then we lived experience stories um uh, uh, looking at uh, cases of um sadash and and halabja thank you so much for that and then we heard from um uh, about the the overall kind of impacts of chemical weapons and Paul um, was the last speaker who who gives some numbers etc and also spoke specifically about the OPCW we've put information and details in the chat with regards to um, ke keeping in contact but um, I think that the last words really and the last shout out should go to two people who made this possible in addition to the speakers Spencer who's doing all the work behind the scenes massive shout Died out, Spencer, for you and your leadership for putting this together. And, and I'd love to leave the final words to uh, Aleha, please, if you can uh, take, take it away and uh, close us up. Thank you. Sure. Um, just one quick question. We have two questions. Are we going to address them briefly or just I do think it's time to say goodbye I think if you can address them quickly if that's okay you, you're, you're you're leading this and, and Spencer but I think if you can address them quickly that would be that would be great so we don't leave so, people hanging <laughs> yeah 
So one uh, question was actually from Spencer about the differences between chemical weapons uh, disarmament and biological weapons disarmament. So just to, they are completely different, just to bring up the treaties, Chemical Weapons Convention Treaty has 90, 193 signatories. It has a verification regime. Uh, it has an organization to, to support its implement, implementation. Biological weapons has uh, 183 uh, member states. It doesn't have a verification regime. It doesn't have an organization. Uh, the budget is not comparable and uh, it has only three personnel to, to support the treaty. So it's really uh, not comparable, I guess. In, in, that, in that sense. And the second one, just uh, about the violation of chemical weapons convention, I think Paul covered that in the case of Syria, for example, their uh, right to vote can be suspended and uh, some measures can be taken with Security Council. Uh, so that is a general idea, but um, I think that's all the time we have, but please feel free to contact us, you, uh, we can refer to the video to find our information on LinkedIn and, and emails. Um, thank you all so very much. Um, when I brought up the idea uh, a couple of months ago to Spencer, I didn't really uh, think it can happen, but it was always very important for me to, to do something for the victims. Uh, they have been the ones who have inspired me to work for peace during the years at Tehran Peace Museum. And I'm really glad that I had the chance to share this moment with you. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, as we go forward, we will have, we will see redu reduction uh, of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Hopefully, one day we will see a world free of mass uh, weapons of mass destruction, especially chemical weapons. And meantime, uh, I think it's good we all do whatever we can to support the victims and to support this process. Um, thank you, Phil, for moderating the session, Spencer, for supporting us, uh, all the speakers, uh, Professor Ghani, uh, Dr. Walker, Homeran, uh, Homeran, and um, Mr. Zanaku Muhammad. It was great to have you all, uh, and all the participants who spent time, uh, their time with us. Mm, it was a great uh, chance to meet you today, and I wish you all a uh, very good day. Thank you, everyone. Have fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.